All right, so hello everyone and welcome again to Introduction to Criminal Justice. Today we are looking at the ultimate punishment, otherwise known as the death penalty. So when people ask and they kind of question um, whether or not the death penalty is constitutional, uh, one thing I always say is, is, I try not to let people in on my opinion, but I always say it's absolutely constitutional because by definition, the Constitution provides in both the Fifth and the Fourteenth Amendments, quote, nor shall any person be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. So that being said, when we constitutionally challenge the death penalty, it's generally in regards to the crimes that are death penalty eligible, the people for whom the death penalty can be applied, and the methods of execution, right? So those are our, our three big cha our, our challenges. Um, to date, no method of execution has been deemed unconstitutional in the United States. So you can still get the gas chamber in certain states. You can still get firing squad in Utah. You can still be hung in New Jersey. Um, yeah, it, it, it's, it, the, we haven't ever gotten rid of a uh, method of execution as being unconstitutional. Though we have far away from it, right? We've gone from hangings and firing squads and all that jazz to largely, um, and, and we've largely stopped the use of the electric chair. And overwhelming majority of death penalty jurisdictions use um, lethal injection, right? Um, it, it's thought to be the most humane um, way to go thus far, right? but no method of execution has been deemed unconstitutional. Uh, generally speaking, you cannot execute someone who is under 18 at the time of the offense. And so if they were 17 and tomorrow was their birthday and today they went out and um, murdered the hell out of somebody and you were in a death penalty state, you could not put them to death, right? They could be eligible for um, a life with the possibility of parole. We know now that you can't sentence somebody who is under 18 at the time of the offense to even life without the possibility of parole. So that possibility still has to be there, still has to come into play. Now, that being said, um, when we talk about what crimes are death penalty eligible, this is where we've seen a lot of movement in terms of uh, constitutionality and challenges to things like that. So generally speaking, um, in the state level, only murder is death penalty eligible, right? So before, uh, and, and, and not too um, long ago, the death penalty could be used for a number of offenses, right? Depending on what state you're in. So it could be used for rape, be used for rape of a child. It could be used for any number of things. Supreme Court has told us, no, it's, it's murder and murder at, like at the state level. Now, the federal level, there's no real federal murder statute unless you're talking murder of a federal officer. But in that case, uh, the, the, the feds do have the death penalty. So murder, treason, and very specified federal crimes are like su such as using a weapon of mass destruction are death penalty eligible at the federal level, right? So murder, treason, and very specified crimes such as using a weapon of mass destruction. And the most recent case that I'm aware of, and I know there's a case pending before the court soon, uh, is Madison v. Alabama. This is a 2019 case um, in which the Supreme Court made a really interesting decision. Again, this was about whom we could execute. Uh, so there was a man who was on death row, he was on it for a very, very long time, and he developed very severe dementia, right? To the point that he could not remember his crime or understand why he was being put to death. And his attorneys challenged the death penalty in that case and said you know, to the court, hey, like, this is, this is not technically the same person or, or, or um, it's cruel and unusual to put somebody to death who can't understand why they're being put to death, 
right? And we've held that, and, and this is legal terminology, so please excuse it. Um, we've held that where there's cases of, again, legal terminology, mental retardation, um, we won't put somebody to death, generally, if, if they can't understand why they're being put to death. Well, that's usually, again, that, that kind of stems from having a, what we call a mental disease or defect, right? But this is uh, different. This isn't a, a person who, um, you know, at the time what was uh, in a state of dementia, right? The person, this person was in a fully coherent, fully knew what they were doing, state of, theoretically state of mind. Um, so it's a lot different than if we're putting somebody to death who, who maybe has uh, intellectual disabilities because they would have had intellectual disabilities at the time of the murder and then theoretically at the time of being put to death. But the Supreme Court has told us that people with intellectual, intellectual disabilities, basically people who cannot understand why they're being put to death, um, it's cruel and unusual to put them to death, right? So um, we, the, the case is usually just converted over to life without possibility of parole or life with the possibility of parole depending on jurisdiction. Now, Madison v. Alabama, the um, court ultimately held that it would be cruel and unusual punishment to put somebody to death who had an intellectual or, or who had so severe dementia that they could not remember the crime and they could not, under, because of it, they couldn't understand why they were being put to death, right? So uh, what ultimately is going to happen is, 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 is the man is, is going to um, most, likely, most likely be transferred to a pres prison medical or facility um, housing, some kind of housing block um, to, live, to, to live out his, his remainder of his days. So they can use this sentence to uh, life in prison. Now, he might, it's, it's unlikely, especially in Alabama, um, it's unlikely he'll be eligible for what's called compassionate release. But there's an argument there that he could be. So compassionate release is this, this notion that a person is serving life imprisonment or they're in prison for a very long time. And they, let's say they develop very severe cancer, right? And they only have two months left to live. Well, a lot of times we will do what's called compassionate release, right? We'll say, okay, like you're gonna die. You should be at home with your family, right? And so we release you from the system. Um, usually you have to petition and usually it has to come from Department of Corrections or, or at the order of a governor. Um, so it's not used that often, but it is um, a possibility. Now, it's doubtful that in Massive, Alabama, the, 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 the man will um, be compassionately released, um, considering the, under crime, uh, the underlying crime that he committed um, was a really kind of heinous murder. So, but that is a, a possibility now, right? So we're at this place where we cannot execute someone unless they understand why they are being put to death. So let's look at the states. Uh, so this was as of 2020, um, as of the summer. Um, states with the death penalty, states without the death penalty, and states with governor-imposed moratoriums. So you'll see there's actually quite a, quite a resemblance to the um, election map, right? The election that we just went through, the federal uh, or the, the presidential election map. Uh, it, it's very, very similar. Uh, it's a, and and I mean, there's some exceptions, but states tend to follow um, leanings in terms of, of political leanings uh, that go with the majority of the state in terms of how they interpret the death penalty and if they're pro-death penalty or not pro-death penalty. Now, you can still be pro-death penalty and be Democrat and be anti-death penalty and be Republican. Like, there's no like requirements, right? Um, because people are complex and there's complex issues. Right? And this is one of the most complex issues that we could ever deal with. Um, and one of the most difficult issues, right? That we could ever deal with. So you'll see that red states, there's quite a few. Uh, you'll see blue states, there's quite a few, and the blue states are in places that you would think are blue, right? 
Um, York, not a shock, it's blue. Um, what's interesting is, you know, California is always accused of being very, very liberal, but they do have the death penalty. They use it like crazy, um, except there is currently, and I believe will continue until Californians vote to abolish it, uh, the death penalty. So governor imposed moratorium in California, governor imposed moratorium in Washington, a governor imposed moratorium in Pennsylvania, right? And Pennsylvania is obviously the, um, the state that, that gave Joe Biden the presidency. So um, it may be starting to lean towards a place where it could be abolished. But right now, the Democratic governor um, has imposed a moratorium saying that no people can be executed in the state, right? So if that could change with the next governor, right, the next governor could change their mind completely. Um, but that's just kind of where that lies. Uh, so uh, like I said, it, it could be changed or it could be um, how the state trended towards uh, Vice President-elect Joe Biden. Um, could very well be a sign that the uh, attitudes of the population are shifting and maybe shifting towards the blue column. Although Pennsylvania has always kind of tended to kind of been the, the bellwether middle state. So that just gives you an idea, idea of like visually where the death penalty is, red, where the death penalty isn't, blue and purple, right? Um, so again, and remember purple can change um, with the governors. So that being said, uh, what we are going to watch is the last 24 hours, or the final 24 hours, on death row. So you get to see kind of what happens in terms of the last, yeah, last 24 hours, right, of, of somebody's life in prison. What, it, what is it like? What is it like to experience that? What all do we do? What all do we um, push through? So that being said, this is on YouTube. I did not steal it. I just linked to it from YouTube. Um, it does, I think it has like a commercial break at one point and then it gets kind of cut off. Like whoever put this on, whoever like pirated this did a really crappy job, but it's a very good example of, of um, something that might strike your curiosity for our debate for the next class. So that being said, what's gonna happen is I'm going to play the video. When the video ends, uh, you can sign off. The course or the, the class will be ended for the day. Then we'll move on to our debate days, um, followed by the last days, which we will watch and talk about the ethics in criminal justice, specifically around the, the documentary, The 13th. Down. The final 24 hours to execution. Just don't simply get a man and walk him from his cell and execute him. The policy book prescribes a schedule hour by hour and even down to minute by minute. But executions don't always go according to the plan. His head caught on fire and his leg caught on fire. The needle was dangling there. It came out. That kind of was a messy deal. From the long walk to the last meal. It won't take it long before all it is is uh, stomach contents on an autopsy report. There are not a lot of people who have the opportunity to actually see someone die. Inside accounts from the men who worked there reveal the last 24 hours on death row. It's routine for us. Death row. On average, condemned inmates spend 15 years here. The time is spent appealing against their sentence. If the appeals fail, the journey to the execution chamber begins here in the judge's office. What first occurs is the order. That sets the date. And then within 10 days, you sign what's called the warrant of execution. 
Dallas Judge Robert Francis has presided over five death penalty convictions. The warrant of execution authorizes that the person to be executed is supposed to be executed in a certain room, in a certain manner, at a certain date, at a certain time. Each state has a different protocol for execution because it's up to that state's legislature. There are five methods of execution in use today, and 14 states allow the prisoner to choose how he will be put to death. Hanging. Today, inmates in Washington state can choose hanging. Since 1776, more people have been executed by hanging than by any other method. The firing squad, most recently used in Utah in 2010. It's available to prisoners convicted there before 2004. Electrocution. Most executions in the 20th century used the electric chair. It's an option for inmates in Alabama, Florida, South Carolina, and Virginia. Lethal gas. Last used in Arizona in 1999, the gas chamber is still a choice for inmates in Missouri and California. And finally, lethal injection. First used in 1982, most executions in the past two decades have been by lethal injection. It is now the primary method of execution in all 33 death penalty states. Execution as a state sanctioned or state approved homicide. I remember signing the very first one. The first time I did it, that was the end of work that day. It is a, a strange feeling knowing that signature is required, that signature is yours. Once the death warrant is signed, the countdown to execution begins. You move the inmate from death row to the death chamber 24 hours before he's executed. Alan Alt conducted five executions as Commissioner of Corrections in Georgia. Come to the door, Phoebe Street. The policy book prescribes a schedule, hour by hour, and even down to minute by minute. Go ahead and turn around and put your back towards the door. Everything you did with the inmate, everything you did in the execution chamber, the way you handled witnesses, the way you handled the victim's family, the routine that you went through was exactly the same. Each death penalty state conducts executions according to its own protocol and timeline. From 1967 through 1976, there were no executions in America, while legal challenges to the death penalty were considered. In 1977, Executions resumed when convicted murderer Gary Gilmore faced a firing squad in Utah. Since then, Texas has conducted more executions than any other state. Their protocol has become a model for many others. Since we do so many executions in Texas, there's somewhat of being experts at it, I guess. Jim Willett was warden of Huntsville Prison, where all Texas death sentences are carried out. He oversaw 89 executions in three years there. Well, I don't know if you'd call it an executioner's school, but you've got these states out there that may not have done an execution in 10 years, and so they'll come here to see how we do it. Can you go ahead and remove all your clothes? Prior to leaving death row and getting on the van to come to the death house, the inmate would be searched really well. Hands up your arms. Wiggle your fingers. Step a little closer. Wiggle your tongue a little bit. You'd want to search the inmate and make sure he doesn't have a weapon so that he uh, couldn't do damage to himself or commit suicide. Can you turn around? The bottom line on execution is it's a court order. So anything other than an execution by the state would have not been acceptable per the court order.
Terry Green was a member of the Texas execution team at Huntsville Prison. He participated in 102 lethal injections. The execution team was viewed as somewhat an elite unit, primarily because of the uniqueness of the duty, the care and the commitment that had to be brought to that duty. Also known as the tie-down team, it's composed of prison staff. No one is compelled to take part. Everyone that's involved is a volunteer. It just wasn't something that everyone was able to do, was comfortable doing. Our first assignment was to go to death row, bring the inmate back to the death house. In Texas, it's a 45-mile journey from death row at the Polunsky unit to the place of execution in Huntsville, known as the death house. You ready? Step. The drive is the most vulnerable part of the transfer. The transport process was probably the inmate's last chance of escape and probably the best chance he'd ever had to escape, assuming he had outside help. We didn't take it lightly. The three-vehicle convoy varies the route taken to avoid ambush. The atmosphere within the van was solemn. We all knew where we were going and why. It all contributed to the fact that nobody said a whole lot. The precautions work. In Texas, no one has ever escaped during transport to the death house. Once the inmate is escorted into the death house from the transport van, that will be the last time he'll see the light of day. In the prison kitchens, the inmates' request for a last meal has been received. My name is Brian Price, and I am the death row chef. Brian Price was an inmate in Texas Huntsville Prison. I went to prison in 1989 on a 15-year sentence, and when you arrive in prison, they assign you a job. I was a musician and a photographer, and they told me, well, not any longer, now you're in the kitchen. While working in the Huntsville unit kitchens, Brian prepared 189 last meals. During their last weeks on death row, the inmate would be given a last meal request, which I have here. Imagine what's going through their minds. This is my last meal on this earth. And I would start putting the ingredients together, whatever I was going to need on the day of the execution. I had them prepared ahead of time if I could. Each state has its own rules about what a prisoner is allowed to request. In Florida, Inmates can order food with a maximum cost of $40. In Oklahoma, the limit is $15. The death row inmates, they did not have a, a choice of whatever meal they were going to have every day. Here they have a, a choice, something they haven't had probably in two decades. Once the inmates brought into the death house, cell door secured, it's not unsecured again until such time as it's time for the execution to take place. First thing I would see in the majority of them was fear. Fear of that place. That was death house. The prisoner has been transferred from death row to a holding cell in the death house. There are 21 hours to execution. First person they would meet in the death house was me. Reverend Carol Pickett was chaplain at Texas Huntsville Unit. He was involved in 95 executions. First thing I would see in the, the majority of them was fear. Fear of that place. That was death house. The role of the chaplain is to provide comfort to the inmate. His role is to make sure this guy is prepared to die, spiritually. I was to do anything and everything to help him face that last day, whatever it was, writing letters, making phone calls, singing songs, listening, listening and listening. As night falls, the inmate can sleep if he wishes to. 
While in the death house, guards will keep a constant watch, ensuring he does not attempt suicide. On the morning of the day of execution, the equipment to be used in the death chamber may need to be tested. Lethal injection is carried out on a specially designed bed, or gurney. Prior to the execution, the staff would go in there to make sure that the straps were in good working order, that the phone to the governor's office was working and it was in communication with the governor's office. The phone is needed because even on the day of execution, the inmate has a slim chance of avoiding death. When you reach the point that you've got to the day of execution, the defendant's attorneys are filing more motions and so forth. The lawyers are feverishly trying to do something to get a stay. They're going to be out of the state system, in the federal system. They'll file them directly with the Fifth Circuit Court. Once the Fifth Circuit Court acts, it's very rare that the Supreme Court takes any action beyond that, uh, unless there's some new, novel, uh, worthy issue. Unless an appeal succeeds, in the death house, preparations continue. For an electrocution, both the chair and its electrical components must be tested. Jerry Givens was Virginia's executioner from 1982 to 1999. He carried out 25 electrocutions. I will be the, the dummy acting out the inmate's part, and they will scrap me in. And if I could kick my leg or move my leg, I would make sure that they tighten that. I didn't want no staff to get kicked in the face. The technology of electrocution has changed little since the first electric chair was used in 1890. This was the uh, Texas electric chair, dubbed Old Sparky by the inmates, and it was used first in 1924. And on the first night they used it, they electrocuted five men. Electric chairs are made of wood, so they will not conduct. The electricity will flow through a headpiece and a leg piece. This piece here was placed on the head, and there's another piece down here that would be placed on the left ankle. When connected to a power source, these will form a deadly circuit through the body of the inmate. I had a test board. It had 24 100-watt bulbs. And if one of those bulbs didn't light up, then we know we didn't have a good connection coming in, and that's how we used to test it. To ensure good electrical contact, the headpiece and leg piece are fitted with natural sponges soaked in salt water. The reason you use a real sponge is because when you soak the sponge in salt water, the sponge will expand and open up. So when the sponge expands and open up, the flow of electricity can come through. Lethal gas requires very careful preparation. The gas used, hydrogen cyanide, is poisonous and combustible. The gas chamber was the most dangerous method of execution because gas does not discriminate about who it kills. Before every execution, the seals on the gas chamber must be checked for potential leaks. Alan Alt was responsible for the upkeep of gas chambers in Mississippi and Colorado. I bought seals for the gas chamber. I remember that cost 25000 in each place for the seals. Maintenance costs like these make lethal gas the most expensive form of execution. In California and Arizona, the chambers were designed to allow two inmates to be executed at the same time. <laughs> to prepare for an execution by firing squad, marksmen must be recruited. In Utah in 2010, Convicted murderer Ronnie Lee Gardner chose this method, claiming he had lived by the gun, so he deserved to die by the gun. The Utah squad was composed of five law enforcement riflemen. They used Winchester rifles. Four were loaded with 30 caliber ammunition. One was loaded with a blank. This way, the squad would not know who fired the fatal shots. Preparations for hanging have changed little in half a century. 
The most recent was in Delaware in 1996. Convicted murderer Billy Bailey chose hanging over lethal injection, saying, I'm not going to let them put me to sleep. Before the hanging, the rope was boiled and stretched. Bailey's weight was checked against a drop distance table developed by the U.S. Army in 1947. The heavier you were, the, of course, the less drop there would be. It would be more of an art than a science, even with the calculations and things of that nature. Um, of course, you would still have mistakes and, you know, and the necks would get stretched out or the head would just pop off. In the death house cell, the prisoner is kept under constant surveillance as the clock counts down to execution. The inmate is going to get more privileges on his afternoon at the death house than he got during his years of stay on death row. The inmate will be allowed to shower, is allowed to use the phone. What number do you want me to dial? We would dial the number for him. Uh, and allow him to complete his call. That last telephone call, you can't call anybody after that. From then on, the only person you're going to talk to is a chaplain. That was a very traumatic time. When they executed him, his hair caught on fire. And he didn't die right away. In the death house, there are just four hours until execution. If the inmate has selected electrocution, his head may be shaved. Four hours prior to his execution, I will shave his head because the headpiece will fit right down on his head and I can get a good connection. Removing the hair removes a potential hazard. His head is shaved because in a case in Florida, when they executed him, his hair caught on fire. In 1990, six-inch flames leapt from the head of convicted cop killer Jesse Tefero as he was electrocuted. Three jolts of power were required to kill him. He didn't die right away. It was a very obscene scene. <laughs> Florida's governor demanded an investigation into what went wrong. Experienced Virginia executioner Jerry Givens was flown to Florida to test their electric chair. I went to the prison and I examined the equipment. When I look at the, the headpiece and the leg piece, that's what the problem was. They had laced their head and leg piece with that synthetic rubber sponge. So when that leg switched to hit the guy, his head caught on fire and his leg caught on fire. The synthetic rubber sponge might have blocked the flow of electricity. Givens replaced it with a natural sponge. I did three or four tests. Then they had some, somebody from the court to witness the test. And then they reinstate the electrocutions for the state of Florida. Hair or cloth near the points of electrical contact adds to the risk of fire. To minimize this, the inmate's calf may also be shaved and a trouser leg cut off. Now, Huntsville inmate Brian Price would begin to cook the last meal. You had uh, two hours to prepare that meal in and have it sent over to the death chamber, and uh, you didn't, you couldn't make any mistakes because it was a one-time shot. Like I said, at one time when they burnt the chicken, that was just. Whew. The most requested last meal would be cheeseburgers and French fries. Believe it or not, a sort of comfort food, I guess. Some other infamous last meals, like Timothy McVeigh, who was the bomber up in Oklahoma. He requested two pints of uh, mint chocolate chip ice cream. Serial killer Ted Bundy requested steak, eggs, hash browns, and coffee. John Wayne Gacy ordered a dozen deep fried shrimp, a bucket of fried chicken, and a pound of strawberries. If I was in the inmate's shoe, I would order caviar from the Black Sea and hope that they would take a long time to bring it. I did everything I could to send it over there the way they wanted it. Of course, it won't take it long before all it is is uh, stomach contents on an autopsy report. 
Once, Brian was allowed to eat one of the last meals he had prepared. A condemned man had ordered four bacon, lettuce, and tomato sandwiches. The man had tried to take his own life the night before. He'd been hoarding what we call tonguing a uh, tranquilizer for several days where you put them under your tongue and you act like you, you swallow, but you don't throw in the tongue. He took them out and hit them. And then he took them all at one time to try to cheat the executioner. Well, they life flighted that man down the Galveston to the prison hospital and pumped his stomach and brought him back to consciousness and then flew him back to the death house for his execution. So my helper, my friend and I, uh, we ate those four bacon, lettuce, and tomato sandwiches, which is my favorite sandwich, by the way. First one I'd had in 10 years. In 2011, Texas ended the tradition of the last meal request. Now, inmates get whatever is being served in the prison that day. When the last meal is delivered to the inmate, he is uh, no more than two hours away from execution time. Joe! While the prisoner eats his final meal, the men and women who will witness the execution begin to arrive at the prison. The role of the witnesses by law is to confirm that an individual was actually executed. So they witness the actual execution. People volunteer to do this. In many states, civilians with no connection to the crime must be present. In Texas, families of the victim have been allowed to attend since 1995. The inmate is also allowed to choose witnesses. The victim's witnesses and the inmate's witnesses are kept separate. They're never allowed to mingle. Other witnesses include representatives from the media. Probably I have seen more executions than any other person in the country. Houston journalist Michael Gratchik has covered more than 300 executions for the Associated Press. There are not a lot of people who have the opportunity to actually see someone die. We see dead bodies, but under these circumstances where you actually get to see someone breathe their last breath, uh, sure, it makes it, it can be difficult. Executions used to be conducted in public and anyone could attend. They would prepare food and stuff like that, and once the execution was completed, they would, you know, throw a little party. The last public execution was held in Owensboro, Kentucky, in 1936. It was watched by 10,000 people and widely criticized for its carnival spirit. After executions, violence would happen, and it, it's like working up a mob. The largest number of witnesses since the Kentucky hanging was in 2001 for the execution of convicted Oklahoma City bomber Timothy McVeigh. 30 witnesses attended, and 250 relatives of the victims watched the lethal injection on closed circuit television. With one hour to go before the execution takes place, the executioner makes his way to the death chamber. The role of the executioner is absolutely the key part of the whole process. In Texas, the identity of the executioner is never officially disclosed. Whenever he'd walk across the recreation yard, go into the officer's dining room, everyone that he would pass, you could see them lean toward each other and go, he's alive. In Florida, the job is carried out by a civilian who is paid $150. The role of the executioner is to make sure that the job is done correctly and precise as possible. It's the executioner who will administer the lethal injection, start the electrocution, or throw the switch which will mix the chemicals used in the gas chamber. The first thing that's going to catch his eye is that gurney, which is the place he's going to die. There are just 30 minutes to execution. In Texas, the warden comes to the death house with a five-man tie-down team. 
I looked him right in the eye, and I would call him by his last name, and I'd say, it's time to go with me to the next room. If the prisoner is not compliant, he will be carried to the death chamber. Members of the tie-down team would suit up and use the force gear, which included helmet, chest pads, shin pads, elbow pads. The lead man would have a plastic shield. We were able to take control of the inmate, have him on the gurney, sometimes within a minute. The vast majority of inmates present no resistance. Of the 89 inmates that I dealt with, I only have one that I would say was a problem and uh, hard to deal with. I would tell the inmate to follow me. I would turn my back to that inmate and walk him into the death chamber. The long walk in the prison is maybe 10 feet. It's not a long walk, but that walk feels like the long walk, even to us. When the inmate walks into the death chamber, it's going to be the first time he's seen that death chamber. The first thing that's going to catch his eye is that gurney, which is the place he's going to die. Once the death chamber is reached, he's advised to sit up on the gurney, then lie down on his back. Each member of the tie-down team is responsible for securing a part of the prisoner's body to the gurney. We would normally always have the same position. For example, I would be at the left arm and take care of a strap across the upper torso. Within 30 seconds, those officers would have all those straps, and there's a bunch of them. In a small room adjoining the death chamber, Behind a one-way window, the executioner readies the drugs. Tubes lead from the executioner's room into the death chamber through a hole in the wall. Now, the medical team must insert them into the prisoner's veins. The American Medical Association advises doctors not to take part in executions because it is a violation of their code of ethics. In Texas, the tubes are inserted by a medical technician. It seems that when people get real nervous, sometimes those veins just kind of up like they usually do. Some of them have burnt veins from drugs, which would make the injection process longer and much more painful. When the tubes are connected, a harmless saline solution begins to flow. The lethal drugs will not be administered until the inmate has said his last words. At that point, we're probably 15 minutes away, at most, from the execution. Even at this late stage, the inmate might receive a stay of execution. There's two phones in there, one connected to the governor and one connected to the attorney general. If either of those phones ring, everything stops. A stay might be given to allow a court more time to consider new submissions by the defense lawyers. On numerous occasions, the execution would be stayed, sometimes for an hour, sometimes for a day, and sometimes for a month. Convicted murderer James Autry was one of the first inmates scheduled to die by lethal injection in Texas in 1983. He was lying on the gurney, and two minutes before they were to start the process of killing him, he got to stay. So he was taken back to death row. No one on death row knew what to expect from the new method of execution. But Autry had been through more of the process than any prisoner alive. He told everybody exactly what took place, so there was no more secrets. James Autry was eventually executed in March 1984. More than 130 people have been wholly exonerated after being sentenced to death. Ronald Kearney is one of them. He was facing the gas chamber for a murder he was later acquitted of. This was my cell right here.
We could talk in these vents up here and talk to the people upstairs. That was our telephone system. Shortly before Carney was due to be taken to the gas chamber, a prison official asked for his last request. I told him, all right, here's my request. I said, when I'm in that chair, and they drop that pellet and the gas starts to come up, I want you to come in there and hold my hand. <laughs> then, new evidence came to light, and Kiney's lawyers succeeded in proving his innocence. I'm asking Lord, is this what this means? Does this mean we're done? We're done and everything? He says, yeah, you're done. You're going home. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> Without the legal attention given to death row cases, Kiney might not be free today. If I was sentenced to life in prison, I would still be here. Nobody would have looked at the case. When I lowered those glasses, it was time for the executioner to do what he had to do. There are 15 minutes until execution. The prisoner is restrained on the gurney. In Texas, the witnesses are now ushered into two viewing areas. Associated Press journalist Michael Gratchik has witnessed hundreds of executions there. You hear people talk about uh, a seat in the death chamber. There are no chairs. You are allowed to bring in a pad and, and a writing implement, and that's it. Once the witnesses are brought into the room, I tell the inmate that he can make his last statement. Sorry for what I've done. To prevent delay, in Texas, the inmate is allowed a few minutes to make his final statement. California's protocol states that a brief final statement can be made. Kentucky imposes a two-minute limit. Pennsylvania allows only written statements. When the inmate has said his last words, He's probably looking at another couple of minutes of life. I would put my hand below their knee or on the ankle where I could feel a pulse. But they could feel it too. The warden would take his glasses off. When I lowered those glasses, it was time for the executioner to do what he had to do. Three states allow the use of one drug for lethal injection. Three states do not specify what procedure they use. All the other states, including Texas, specify three drugs in sequence. I will take the first drug, screw it in, and push it. The first drug is a barbiturate, which sedates the inmate. Occasionally, the inmate will say, I can feel it, or, uh, you know, it, it's working. If the inmate has chosen electrocution, he will be strapped to a wooden chair. The headpiece and leg piece are attached. Some states also cover the face with a mask. It's routine. It's a matter of seconds. In Virginia, the warden and chaplain remain in the death chamber. A signal is given, and the current switched on. When I give the order to execute, there's a real, physical, violent jolt of the body. It would automatic run for 45 seconds on a high cycle. Protocols vary. But Givens would deliver two bursts of electricity at 2,400 volts and between two and four amps. You can actually hear the electricity, high voltage electricity going through the line. You can see the body swell and drop back. Then you're going to smell the flesh burning. It's, it's, an awful, it's, it's an awful, greasy smell. And then... The body is slumps. If I had a choice between electrocution and lethal injection, and if I was in that predicament, I would pick electrocution because I know it's faster.
For execution by lethal gas, the prisoner is strapped into a wire mesh chair and the chamber sealed. When the signal is given, cyanide tablets are mixed with sulfuric acid inside the chamber. The gas produced is deadly hydrogen cyanide. There would be some moaning, gargling type noises. Severe shaking, foaming of the mouth. You're actually feeling like you're strangling to death. Once they actually uh, could no longer hold their breath, the process would take four to seven minutes. It's not a pleasant death. All of a sudden, I see this liquid begin squirting toward me. And you're thinking, what if this gets on me, you know? In the death chamber, the inmate has made his final statement. The warden has given the signal to execute him. Now, lethal drugs flow into the prisoner's veins. In minutes, he should be dead. But sometimes there is what's known as a blowout. During the execution of convicted murderer Raymond Landry in Texas in 1988, the tubes came out of his arm. There was no glass that separated us from the inmate. And we're watching the inmate being put to death, and all of a sudden, I see this liquid begin squirting toward me. And you're thinking, what if this gets on me, you know? The medical team reinserted the tubes, and 14 minutes later, the execution continued. The next time we went into the chamber, they had put up the glass, and uh, that was the uh, inauguration of uh, the glass that separated us from the inmate. There was a second Texas blowout in 1998 during the execution of convicted murderer Joseph Cannon. It was Jim Willett's first time in charge. The inmate turns his head towards me and he said it came out. And sure enough, the needle was dangling there. And so uh, that kind of was a messy deal. If there are no problems in the death chamber, the first drug sedates the inmate. Once the drug is completed through the line, I can see the flow going down the line, then I will flush it with a saline solution. The saline flush is used because if the lethal drugs were to mix, solid particles might form and block the tubes. After the saline flush, the second drug, pancuronium bromide, is delivered. It will paralyze the inmate. As the drugs have take effect, their skin color begins turning almost crimson or purplish as the person is dying. I think if a fly will fly around in there, you could hear his wings flap. That's how quiet it is in there. The third drug, potassium chloride, stops the heart. I'm standing there and the pulse stops. The execution is not officially complete until a medical doctor has checked the body for vital signs. He would do all those things that doctors do in order to be sure that someone's dead. He will look at a clock on the wall and give the time of death, and then we turn around and file out. If the inmate was executed using lethal gas, toxic residue is a real danger. The gas chamber is vented, and the team enters clad in protective suits. They would try to decontaminate the body by running their fingers through the hair, shaking off the clothing as much as possible to get as much of the, the powder itself off of the person. The electrical resistance of the human body causes it to heat up during electrocution. Afterwards, the corpse is left five minutes to cool before being removed. If no one claims the body, it will be buried the next day at the prison cemetery. 
When you see a grave, any grave, anywhere out there that has an X on it, that means he was executed. I remember the faces of the men I execute, and they appear in my nightmares. I guess for some people, it's easy, but it's, it, for me, it, was, it wasn't easy. I wasn't getting paid for this. I was doing it because this was the state of Virginia's head, too. You know, this is, this is the law. I've gotten in trouble among death penalty opponents when I say that it's done with great dignity, but I think it is. I have no regret from having participated in the execution process. I always viewed it as a mandate from the court, and we were the tools by which that order was carried out. As always, if you have any questions, please reach out to me.